Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome everyone. Uh, this is going to be a course on principles and applications of NMR spectroscopy. Um, I am Hanudatta Atreya from NMR Research Center in IASC Bangalore. I work primarily in the area of biomolecular NMR uh, looking at different structures of proteins and nucleic acids. Um, in this course, we are going to basically introduce you to a very basic aspects of what is NMR spectroscopy, uh, what are the principles involved, uh, how NMR spectroscopy can be applied. Uh, to different areas of uh, chemistry and biology. So, the uh, we will start from the very basic applications of NMR spectroscopy. As you can see, NMR spectroscopy is a very unique spectroscopic tool. It has applications in a wide area of uh, science and technology. Uh, for example, it is applicable in agriculture, in medicines. Uh, this is very popular application called magnetic resonance imaging and that is where MRI is used. And uh, we will see shortly in this course towards the end that MRI magnetic resonance imaging is essentially NMR. Uh, NMR spectroscopy is also used in different areas like NMR microscopy, food technology. In fact, uh, in testing many of the food products nowadays uh, in many companies abroad is done by NMR spectroscopy. Uh, but the main focus, the, the major focus of this course uh, will be on what is called structural biology and uh, structural chemistry. These are two major applications which has now uh, come up in last 20 years and we will see how nicely NMR spectroscopy can be used in this area. Uh, so, uh, having said that you know, NMR spectroscopy applicable is applicable in various uh, fields and uh, therefore, there are a lot of Nobel prizes which have gone uh, given to uh, different uh, discoveries made in NMR uh, starting from the very big the beginning of uh, NMR which is 1952 Nobel prize was given to uh, Felix Bloch and Purcell who actually independently and simultaneously discovered the phenomenon of NMR spectroscopy. Uh, Richard Ernst got Nobel Prize uh, in 1991 and Richard Ernst is a very common name in chemistry and physics. Everybody uh, is uh, familiar with what is called Fourier transform NMR, FT NMR, uh, which is the, the technique which is used in routinely in chemistry and Richard Ernst discovered and uh, developed many of the two dimensional NMR methods which we will see in uh, during this course. Uh, Kurt Wuttrig, Professor Kurt Wuttrig from ETH and that is Switzerland, uh, he got Nobel Prize, was awarded Nobel Prize in 2002 uh, and his main contribution was developing new methodologies for uh, structure determination of biomolecules. So, this is where basically NMR took off from being a tool of chemist to a being a tool of biologist, mainly structural biologist and this was a phenomenal growth, uh, it has seen a phenomenal growth after that uh, and we will look at how NMR can be used for uh, structure determination of small biomolecules such as peptides and proteins in this course. And a major major use of NMR as I mentioned in the previous slide uh, is in the area where we can look at imaging. Uh, so, this is the Nobel Prize which was awarded in 2003 to Peters Mansfield and Paul Lutterberg. They, uh, they had done they had done seminal contributions uh, to uh, MRI uh, and MRI basically involves imaging of the whole body of the human or animal and actually capturing uh, the anatomy of the human system. So, you can see the huge range of applications uh, which NMR has right from physics uh, to looking at chemistry and biology uh, and looking at the uh, imaging. So, why is NMR such a very unique tool? So, this is what we will see now in this next slide. Uh, it is a very unique spectroscopic tool among all the other techniques which uh, you might be aware of. Uh, the first and foremost is that NMR spectroscopy is a non-invasive and a non-destructive method. What does is this mean? This means that uh, if you take a sample of your compound of your molecule uh, and uh, record NMR data on that, you get back the sample intact. Nothing happens to the sample, it is not destroyed and therefore, it is a very non-invasive, a uh, very nice non-invasive technique. In fact, in MRI uh, the same thing applies because the, uh, it's the whole body imaging is done in a non-destructive and a non-invasive manner. So, NMR is unique among uh, many other techniques uh, in this respect. The next uh, uh, point is that NMR spectroscopy, you can actually study each and every atom in a given molecule. Uh, so, as we know molecules are made up of atoms and there are different types of atoms in a given molecule like in a drug molecule or in a biomolecule. 
in each and every atom can be selectively you can probe them or look at them uh, uh, in a very sensitive manner. And this is this is the major you know the very good uh, advantage of NMR spectroscopy compared to other techniques uh, wherein in other techniques you look at the whole molecule as such you do not actually get a glimpse of each and every atom in the molecule, but that is where NMR uh, helps to come in uh, to help us in finding the structure. Uh, the second another important point about NMR spectroscopy is that you can actually study the, the sample or the compound or molecule which you are uh, studying uh, in under different conditions of pH. You can change the temperature, you can change the solvent, you can change the pressure. So, you can actually play around with any conditions of your sample and keep uh, monitoring the data or looking at the spectra so at different uh, under different conditions. So, this is a major plus point again of NMR because being a non restrictive technique as long as the sample is is uh, is valid or is it is not degraded you can use any different different conditions and probe the uh, data. Uh, NMR spectroscopy again and the next very important point is that it is a very quantitative technique. So, you can actually quantify the, the amount of sample present in your uh, in, in your study. So, this is something which is again it differs from many other techniques. So, because we do not destroy the sample it is a non destructive method you can actually preserve the quantification you can measure what is the amount of uh, the sample present and this is very very useful for many applications. So, for example, when we see what is called as metabolomics where we look at the, the quantity of sample in a in a given mixture you would like to know what is the different amounts relative amounts present and this is where NMR spectroscopy is very useful and again stands out as a unique among other techniques. Uh, we can study all different states of matter such as solids, liquids and gases and this is again a very important thing point because many of the samples like we look at polymers if you look at different materials they are in solid form you cannot make them in liquid form. So, you can use solid state NMR spectroscopy uh, to study that. Uh, liquids is again the solution state which is what 90 percent or most of the people do uh, for using when they use NMR spectroscopy. So, solution state NMR is the standard approach and of course, in some very rare cases you can also look at gases, but our focus in this course will be mainly liquids where we will focus on solution state and a few example if uh, uh, will required we will look at also solid state NMR spectroscopy. So, NMR can be also used for studying dynamics and this is a uh, uh, very nice uh, technique because in many aspect uh, in different uh, methods such as x-ray crystallography uh, what happens is you look at this uh, the sample in a solid form you look in a crystal form and therefore, you have frozen the, the, the sample in time and what you can get only the structural information, but in NMR what you are doing is you are looking at the sample in a solution form. So, in a solution form the sample is in its native state, it is a native state and therefore, it is has all the properties what you would expect in a real scenario uh, and therefore, dynamics is one important property of a molecule. Most of the molecules in solution are very dynamic, you can never they are never static as we see in pictures. So, therefore, the understanding dynamics is a very important po uh, part of understanding the whole function of the molecule and this is some this is where NMR spectroscopy stands out and it helps us to look at dynamics at various time scales. You can go from as small as short as picoseconds uh, to go as a uh, few seconds. So, you can see there is a wide time scales of uh, uh, dynamic processes that can be studied by NMR. So, we will also look at uh, this in this point this course. So, uh, before we go on to the details of the course I would uh, like to suggest some books uh, which you can actually refer to during this course. Uh, there is a very nice book by called NMR spectroscopy explained by Neil Jacobson uh, and some of them are available online uh, and you can have a look at them. Uh, James Keeler's book which is understanding NMR spectroscopy is the most popular book today among students and this is something which is very nice can be looked at. If you are interested in biological uh, systems which we will go to focus a little bit in this course uh, this book by Professor Chari and Govil is a very very important book. Uh, and uh, so, while all these books are going to be used in some way or the other, uh, we'll you can uh, we can uh, we'll cover all the details. So, these books will serve as mainly as a reference materials or for more uh, deeper uh, insight if you would like to have in the course. So, uh, let us uh, then begin with this course. Uh, so, before we start, NMR spectroscopy, as the word stands out, it's a spectroscopy technique. So, uh, it is like one of the other spectro many other spectroscopic techniques. So, we need to first understand what is spectroscopy in general, what does spectroscopy mean, what do we actually do uh, in, a, in a spectroscopy. 
in spectra. So, let us start from uh, start from basic concepts uh, in spectroscopy first and then before we move on to NMR. Uh, so, when you look when we talk about spectroscopy, spectroscopy involves the study of interaction of radiation with matter. So, when we say radiation it is basically we are look referring to what is called electromagnetic radiation and this is light. So, like for example, sunlight, sunlight consists of electromagnetic radiation uh, of different wavelengths. So, on the you can see here there is this picture of a wave which is schematic drawing and it shows that there are two components of a electromagnetic wave. One is called the electric field that uh, the blue color and the other is uh, the red color and the other is the magnetic field and these two fields are oriented perpendicular to each other. So, this is the standard picture of, uh, of a wave electromagnetic wave and what and you can see there is what characterizes the wave is the wavelength that is the number of waves uh, which are present per meter or per second. So, when we talk about number of waves per second, we talk about what is called frequency. So, frequency is how many uh, waves are traveling per second and wavelength is the, the length of the wave. So, these are basically two properties which we will be very much using uh, throughout our course uh, because this is a basic aspect of an, a spectroscopy. So, essentially what happens in spectroscopy is you take this kind of a magnetic uh, electromagnetic field or a radiation or a wave and you put shine it on a sample. So, let us say that this what you are seeing in the center is let us say a sample. So, we call it as matter or you can call it as a your molecule or compound. So, when you shine light on this molecule, now the molecule starts responding has to re will respond to the incoming light. So, this incoming light we write it as this h mu this is a photon. Right. So, one photon of energy is uh, uh, energy of one photon is h into mu where h is the what is called as Planck's constant and mu is the frequency of the wave. So, whenever there is a electromagnetic wave its energy is given by h mu. So, this energy h mu is now uh, is shown on the sample and the sample then responds to this wave. So, it can do several things number one it can absorb that wave it can absorb that energy into the system or it can simply scatter that energy it just reflect the energy or it just does not do anything and the wave simply passes through. So, when it so when it simply passes through that means the matter or the sample is transparent it is invisible to the to the light, but when it absorbs then it absorbs the energy and part of it is absorbed part of it is radiated back or reflect uh, transmitted out or part of it is scattered. So, now what is that makes a matter or a compound absorb the energy or react to the energy. So, if you this come for this we have to little bit go into what is called quantum mechanics uh, or in physics. So, we say that if the matter at a micro microscopic at an atomic level does not have a continuum of energy levels. So, it has what is called discrete energy levels that means any sample will have any my compound will have a discrete energy level and this is called quantized system. So, we have a quantized energy levels and now the energy which is shown upon this matter sample will only be absorbed by the matter if the energy matches the difference as shown here a uh, difference between the two energy level. Let us say that we have a, this, this is a very hypothetical system let us say we have what is called a ground state and we have what is called an excited state. So, this is basically different energy levels in a compound in a matter in the sample or in the compound molecule. So, the energy which we are supplying that is h mu if it matches this gap between the ground state and energy excited state then this energy is absorbed by the sample and uh, taken up by then the molecules go from the ground energy level to an excited energy level. So, this is a qualitative way of explaining. Uh, uh, for the deeper understanding I would suggest uh, to also go look at the different books which I refer to, uh, but in a qualitative manner one can understand that when you shine a light on this matter, the matter which has different energy levels in its molecule, the molecules will absorb that energies if there is a difference in the energy level matches the energy which we are supplying. So, this is basically the general idea of a spectroscopy in spectroscopy that you shine light on the matter, the matter either absorbs, reflects or transmits the light and based on that you can find out what what is the what is happening in the what is the nature of this matter. So, the nature of the matter is hidden in a way in the way it, ref, it responds to light. So, based on the response 
to the light which is shown on a matter we can figure out what type of matter what is the inside of this system consists of and we can also look at different types of uh, properties such as the structure of the molecule, the dynamics of the molecule, the vibrations, rotations and so on. So, there are different spectroscopic techniques uh, if you go to the next we will go to the next slide here we see that depending on the property which you want to study for example, let us say you are looking at uh, the dynamics of the molecule or rotation of the molecules or vibrations you can see there are different energies involved. So, that means based on what type of energy I, I, shy, I, I apply to the sample uh, the different properties of the sample will respond uh, to that kind of a spectrum uh, to that kind that light. So, the elect this is called the electromagnetic spectrum where you can see the whole spectrum is now divided into different uh, regions based on the frequency. So, uh, remember frequency is measured in hertz. So, we are going to use this uh, hertz uh, units throughout the course. So, if you start from the lowest frequency that is the lowest uh, longest wavelength remember wavelength and frequency are inversely related. So, if you go to the longest wavelength or the shortest uh, lowest frequency we use that word radio waves. So, this region is called radio waves. Uh, then the next higher little higher energy is called microwave and here the microwave energy if you supply it to the sample or molecule the rotation of the molecules are affected or, ref, or, or respond to this particular range of frequency and this is called microwave spectroscopy. Then the next uh, energy is infrared which is, is responded which depends on the vibrations of the molecules. The vibrations in the molecule respond uh, to infrared radiation uh, which is up if it is applied to the sample. Uh, then comes the electronic uh, transitions that means the electrons in the molecule respond to this energies which is called ultraviolet visible visible and ultraviolet and uh, visible is essentially as a visible word means it is essentially you can see and this is the uh, uh, range <coughs> of frequency ultraviolet is in the higher energy and then as you go further the very high energy rays uh, electromagnetic radiations they are called x ray and x ray is uh, where uh, x ray radiations are used uh, for different applications and one of the very famous application is x-ray crystallography where we look at structures of molecules and further down a higher energy is gamma rays. So, this is the different energy ranges which uh, to which the molecules can respond uh, depending on its property depending on its composition or constitution and structure. So, an NMR spectroscopy will focus on this lowest energy that is radio waves. So, the whole of NMR uh, spectroscopy technique is, is focused on this particular region and the radio waves. So, we can see what is the basic technique, what is the basic apparatus or what setup in a, any spectroscopic in general. As so remember NMR spectroscopy is also a spectroscopic technique. So, many of the things are indeed common with other uh, spectroscopic technique, but the details uh, will vary. Uh, but generally what you need is a source. So, you have a source of radiation and this is what you shine on the sample. So, this is a sample this is just a very schematic uh, qualitative figure. So, you take the radiation which you put it on the sample and the sample will absorb the radiation or transmit and whatever is transmitted is detected by physically a detector which is electronic uh, component and then you analyze it uh, and finally, what is displayed uh, is, is what is called a spectrum. The spectrum is essentially a plot of frequencies. Uh, which are of the light which are absorbed by this radiation. So, the radiation basically is a broad source can be a broad source of radiation and different portions of the radiation can be uh, is absorbed or transmitted by the sample and that is what we we record and display. So, for a, in terms of the perspective of NMR spectroscopy uh, this source will basically be a electro radio wave source a source of radio waves uh, we, as we saw that NMR re relies on radio frequency. So, now let us go to NMR spectroscopy uh, having understood uh, what general spectroscopy means. So, let us go back to this picture uh, where we see that uh, there is a what is called a matter in other words it is a sample or a molecule or a compound. So, you see every molecule as we know from uh, our basic chemistry and physics there is made up of atoms. So, every molecule consists of atom. Now, if you look at atom more closely atom consists of nucleus which is at the center of the atom and it is surrounded by a electron cloud or electrons. Now, if further if you zoom into this nucleus you will see nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons and we use the word nucleons which for both protons and neutrons. Now, neutrons and protons have two properties associated associated with them which we will use in NMR. One of the properties is called charge. So, all of us know that protons are positively charged and neutrons have charge 0 they are neutral. 
uh, but what is one more important property they have is known as spin. So, spin is essentially abstract quantity it is a quantum mechanical quantity. So, although it is not literally that they are spinning, but we can always associate all the properties of motion with this quantity called spin. So, uh, I would uh, suggest that in the back of your mind you uh, keep in mind that it is not literally rotation of a spin which is of a nucleus which is going on, but at the same time we associate a property called spin uh, which has uh, will be very useful. So, the spin of a proton and neutron are same they are called they are fermions and we use the word half h cross this h is a Planck's constant and half h cross h bar we use that is uh, h upon 2 pi. So, both protons and neutrons have spin but the charge is only for proton and neutron does not have a charge. But if you see now the overall nucleus has a positive charge and that is again a well known thing because the neutrons are positively nucleus is positively charged and electrons are negative. So, uh, so this whole positively charged nucleus now has a spin associated with it because the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus have spins along with them. So, now what happens is that the protons and neutrons now start pairing up with each other. So, this is what happens that uh, suppose I have one proton and one neutron they can pair up with each other such that one proton will have a positive half and the other nucleon will have a negative half and they cancel each other. So, pairing essentially uh, cancels out the, the nucleus the, the spin of the particles. So, that means the nucleus after pairing protons and neutrons together you can say that the total nucleus has a net spin value. The net spin value is the value which you come arrive at after pairing up all the protons and neutrons. So, this net spin can have any value as we will see shortly uh, the net spin value can be determined based on the number of protons and neutrons or basically based on the atomic mass and atomic number. But what is important is that the whole NMR spectro the whole technique of spectroscopy NMR spectroscopy relies on the nucleus having a net spin value which is not 0. That means, if all the protons and neutrons pair with each other exactly then the total spin value of pro the nucleus will become 0 because the positive spin will cancel with the negative spin of the, uh, the, the nucleons. And therefore, if the net total spin is 0 then NMR cannot be uh, carried out on that particular molecule. So, the atom. So, that means, this atom or element should have what is called a non-zero spin it cannot have a 0 spin if it is 0 then it cannot be studied by NMR. So, we will see shortly the, uh, what are the conditions uh, which are important for getting a spin not equal to 0 total spin of a nucleus or equal to uh, uh, half integer or integer. So, this this uh, concept that an, a nucleus is uh, we are it is possible to study a nucleus by NMR or element we use the word NMR active. So, we will say this particular NMR is a nucleus is NMR active or this particular nucleus is not active. So, we will say NMR inactive. So, you can see the prop. So, let us look at how uh, one can actually qualitatively determine whether a particular nucleus can be studied by NMR or cannot be studied. So, you can see at this table here it shows uh, how we can estimate. So, let us say on this column here is atomic mass. So, you can have any atom having an E 1 atomic mass or it can be atomic odd atomic mass. Similarly, an atomic number of that atom can be either E 1 or odd depending on the number of protons. So, number of protons will decide whether the atomic number is E 1 or odd and the total number of atoms uh, that is total number of nucleons that is protons plus neutrons determine whether the atomic mass is E 1 or odd. So, this is a very standard basic concept which we learn we learn in chemistry and physics. So, let us say we take a particular uh, nucleus carbon 12 it has 6 at uh, 6 uh, protons and 6 neutrons. So, therefore, it is E 1 atomic number and E 1 atomic mass and therefore, the spin of this is 0 that means, the total all the protons and neutrons pair with each other and the total net value of the spin for that nucleus is equal to 0. So, therefore, we cannot study 12 C by NMR similarly carbon oxygen 16 has 8 protons and 8 neutrons. So, it belongs to this E 1 E 1 category and therefore, it cannot be studied by NMR. Now, let us look at an example where you have odd atomic number and E 1 atomic mass. So, this is the case where example deuterium deuteron this is an isotope of hydrogen and there is the nitrogen 14. So, if you look at this they have 7 protons nitrogen 14 has 7 protons 7 neutrons. So, it has total E 1 atomic mass, but atomic number is odd. So, such, such kind of a uh, element uh, atom or a nuclei 
uh, will have what is called integral value of spins, means the spin will be the integer multiple multiples of 1, 1 and so on. Okay. Now, let us look at another the third case where you have even atomic number and odd atomic mass and such examples for that could be is 13 C uh, carbon uh, oxygen 17. So, 13 C is a very popular uh, nuclei for NMR spectroscopy. So, here if you see we have 6 protons that is E1 atomic uh, number, but we have odd atomic mass. So, this therefore, the spin of this is half integer and it could be half 3 by 2, 5 by 2 and so on uh, that is uh, for oxygen 17 it is 5 by 2 and for carbon 13 it is half. So, there are various rules by which you can determine the exact value of the spin, but the general qualitatively what how we can get the idea is based on this table. Uh, then the last case is essentially odd odd combination uh, for example, this is a very most popular nucleus is proton uh, of course, the, there is no neutrons for hydrogen atom. So, it is called proton. So, it is has one proton and uh, uh, in the nucleus is therefore, odd atomic number also odd atomic weight mass and that is why it is been half integer. A uh, very another important nucleus for NMR is N15, which has 7 protons and 8 neutrons. So, it makes it as an odd odd combination and the spin value is half. So, therefore, these are basically the different conditions by which uh, we can uh, study uh, the, the different NMR properties and we will be focusing on this. So, in the similar in this manner, you can actually extend this idea to the entire periodic table, uh, although it is not very clear each of these numbers here, but the idea the take home uh, take home from this slide is that the many elements in the whole of periodic table which can be studied by NMR spectroscopy because they do not have they have non-zero spin. Okay. So, either the compound the, the element itself can be studied in the natural abundance or it is isotope which will be less abundant. So, abundance is something which we will be very much referring to again and again in this course. The abundance basically means in a given natural state what is the percentage of a given isotope which is present in that molecule. For example, carbon 12 is naturally abundant 99 percent that means 99 percent of the atoms in a molecule containing carbon is carbon 12, 1 percent is carbon 13. So, the for us uh, NMR uh, as far as NMR is concerned only that 1 percent which is present contributes to the signal the remaining 99 percent is not uh, is just blind or transparent to NMR because it has been 0. So, 1 percent is abundance. So, you can see this very the sensitivity is low because only out of 100 atoms carbon one carbon atom will be C 13. So, similarly the abundance and nuclei uh, will vary and uh, based on that the sensitivity is determined. So, as we go on uh, we will look at the different uh, reason or properties. So, sensitivity how does it depend on uh, the atom and nucleus other properties and so on. So, uh, from this onwards we will take up in the next class. Uh, how actually we can look at the spin value and then how does NMR spectroscopy depend uh, on, on this particular spin and how we take it forward. Thank you.